All right, that sets you up for something really exciting, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. So we're going to talk about heroes the next several weeks through to Labor Day. Uh, we're going to go back to the Old Testament. You know that part? It's before the New Testament. Um, yeah. And look at some of the heroes. But here's what I want to say. I want to ask you a question to just kind of start us off today. And it's something that you can talk around the lunch table today if you uh, can't think of anything else to talk about over lunch. Okay? Here's the question. Uh, the people that in your world would kind of hit that hero status kind of position, uh, people that, let's say, uh, uh, people that you would love to have your picture next to, or you'd love to get their autograph, are those people in that picture there because of their accomplishment or because of their character? What creates a hero in your own mind? When I was a little squirt of about eight years old playing what is the best team sport in the whole world ever, hockey. A round of applause for hockey, yes. I had the privilege of meeting one of my hockey heroes. His name is Bobby Hull. Some of you will recognize that. That's just how old I am, right? Uh, but he was, he was the golden jet. He was like the best at everything. And he came to my little Canadian town one day. And uh, I lined up with all the other little boys and finally, it was my turn to stand next to him. And I got a picture. And I got his autograph. And he was bigger than life. It had nothing to do with his character. It had everything to do with his accomplishment, how many goals he scored, and who he was as, a, as an athlete. I, I don't have many pictures, actually, of people who I wanted to get next to and have their autograph and their picture because of their character. This is my friend, Ralph. He tells the truth all the time. I want to get my picture next to him. <laughs> or this is Rebecca. She's got so much integrity. I, I got her signature. I got her autograph. Just, it doesn't happen very much, right? So why do I tell you all that? Well, oftentimes, we read the stories of these heroes in the Bible, and they become bigger than life for us. And they really should in many ways because many of them are people of great faith and went through really difficult times and challenges and they proved to be faithful or they were resolute in their trust of God. But what I've discovered is most of them have a very human side to them as well where they make mistakes that almost disappoint. They don't get everything right all the time. They doubt on occasion and they question and they're not sure. And you know what that does for me? Maybe you too. If they hang in there through challenges and they remain faithful, even when they messed up, up at times, it actually elevates their hero status in some ways. So we're going to look at some of those heroes over the next weeks and see what we can learn from their life. Though they're all Old Testament heroes, is there something about their lives that we could bring into our day and learn from or be encouraged by or challenged by. So let's start with Elijah this morning. Now, many of you will know his story and you'll dive right in and you'll go, I know, what, I know what he did, I know what he accomplished, I know all about his life. But we have lots of folks in our church family who don't, aren't that familiar with the Bible. And the wonderful thing is because they're relatively new to the Bible and they're just learning and they're figuring out. So for the rest of us that know the story, hang in there, look interested, okay? Join in, as I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story. It begins, you can actually read it if you want to, in 1 Kings 17, 18, and 19. You can click to that or turn your Bible to that. We're going to focus on chapter 19 specifically. So it all starts around 860 years before Jesus comes into this world. It's a time in Israel's history where the country has been fractured, been broken apart. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And particularly the northern kingdom at this time has really walked away from God. They're doing their own thing. They've, rather than try to influence the culture for God around them, they've assimilated into the culture around them. And God is kind of a second thought. I know that's crazy to think about because they are God's people and he owns them and he's loved them and he's want to use their experience to show the whole world how good God is and they've abandoned him. In this particular era that Elijah comes into, the king of Israel, of the northern kingdom, is a guy by the name of Ahab. And you actually don't want this denotation or your asterisk beside your name. He's the worst king ever up to that point. Like, that's legit. That's how he's described. Not a good guy. 
make things worse, he marries a woman who's not a Jewish person out of convenience or economic security or whatever it is. He marries a woman by the name of Jezebel. Now, the moment I say Jezebel, what goes off in your mind? This is like the Bonnie and Clyde of, like, they're just a horrible couple. I, 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 any of you name your little, precious, little, sweet daughter Jezebel when she was born? No, I didn't think so. Nobody names their little, precious girl Jezebel because we all know what that stands for. And this was the reality. She was uh, a really strong personality, and uh, her native language and native country worshipped a pagan, invisible, non-existent gods, but they worshipped them nonetheless. And uh, the prominent gods of their day were Baal and Asherah. And this is who she brings into this relationship with Ahab. And Ahab doesn't have the courage or the faith in God to stand up against her and go, time out, we're God's people. It just runs rampant through the whole country. And this is what Elijah comes into. So we don't know a lot of Elijah's background. He just shows up kind of as an adult, it appears. He were told that he's from Tishbe. And this is where Tishbe is. Uh, it is uh, on the east side of the Jordan River. And uh, he must have had some influence in the country because at some point he sends a note off to Ahab about something that's going to happen. And Ahab takes it as truth. Like he, he believes. So how Elijah got this influence, we don't know. But the note that he sends off to Ahab is, God talked to me. And Ahab, he's telling me that there's going to be three years of drought. Now, not just like reduced rainfall. It's not like climate change. There's, there's actually no rain, no dew, no moisture for three years. In a desert climate, that spells disaster. And it does. So shortly after Elijah passes this on to Ahab, he runs into hiding down in the Kerith ravine. There's a brook that's running through there. Now, this is where his hero status starts to rise a little bit. He flees for his own safety, and God shows up to protect him in a really unique way. Every single day, God provides him red meat and bread. That is a winter diet right there. You can live off of that, right? But here's the unique thing. It's brought to him by ravens, by birds, of all things. And I don't think these birds found a dead carcass on the side of the road, and they grabbed a little bit of red meat and brought it home. I think this was filet mignon. This was like the best cuts and bread, and he had water from the brook, and you go, like, that's amazing that God would do that. He doesn't do that every day, but he did it for Elijah. But Elijah's not immune to the drought. The brook that he's at dries up, and now he needs water to, to live off of. And God says, I want you to go north and west of where you are to a place called Zarephath, and there you're going to find a widow who has some food, and she's going to take you in. You'll rent from her or whatever you'll do, but she's going to look after you. So he goes up there. It's about a 60, 70-mile walk for him. Arrives, and sure enough, he finds this widow. Amazing coincidence, right? Interestingly enough, it plays a little bit later in the story in some ways, Zarephath was Jezebel's hometown. And God's going to show up in a really unique way in Jezebel's hometown. How does he do that? Well, Elijah finds this widow. She has a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour left. And then God gives Elijah the ability to understand how to change the molecular structure of oil and flour. Get that. So that as she uses the oil and flour, it just replicates itself. It clones itself. Anybody here able to do that? You see, like this is a special guy, right? We admire that, that God would do it. And then tragedy strikes this family. This widow's only child, a boy, develops some kind of disease, terminal disease, and he dies. Now you have to understand the grief of that, of what goes through this mother. Any of us would experience the same thing. But God, because he's got his hand on Elijah, does something amazing for the first time recorded in human history. Elijah takes that body of that little dead boy, takes it up to an upper room, and under God's instruction, lays down on him and breathes new life 
into that boy. He comes back to life again. Like, come on. That's phenomenal. What a day that must have been for that mom, right? Like, what an incredible day for her. No wonder this guy's a hero. No wonder, like the power of God, like the, the oil and the bread thing. And there's one thing, the oil and the flour is one thing, but to breathe life. I want to hang around people like that, right? Well, God does have his hand on Elijah, but God has something he wants to do through Elijah, not just in this widow's life, but in Ahab and Jezebel's life. So he tells, a, he tells Elijah, I want you to send a message. Go to Mount Carmel, which is just a little way south. I want you to go to Mark, Mount Carmel, have Ahab meet you there, and I want you to tell him that God is sovereign. God's got it. God is supreme. Ahab, worship God. Do that. You belong to him. Well, Elijah's going to do that in a very, very unique way, which raises his hero status even more. Under the direction of God, he tells Ahab to bring 850 of the priests of Baal and Asherah with him, and there's going to be like a showdown, like a gunfight at the OK Corral, okay? This is what's going on. And what it's going to be is these 850 priests of Baal and Asherah are going to build an altar, put a cow on that, 2,500-pound cow, and call for their gods to rain fire from heaven and ignite that offering. That'd be amazing if they could do that, wouldn't it? That'll get your attention. That'll be in tomorrow's newspaper. Absolutely. Well, they started all off at about 9 o'clock in the morning, and by noon, nothing. Evidently, nobody's listening to them. Except Elijah. And this is, the scripture is so funny sometimes. Around noon or so, we're told that Elijah goes to them and goes, Hey guys, your God's not showing up. What's he sleeping? Or maybe he's going to the bathroom. No, it's actually there. Like it's actually recorded in scripture. He's asking them whether their gods are like tinkling in the bathroom or something. It's just amazing, right? Well, he's mocking them. Well, they go through the afternoon, they're, they're, they're crying out louder and more passionately, and no fire, no smoke, no heat, nothing. Just cold beef on rocks. About five o'clock or so, it says that Elijah kind of takes over. And he goes, God, show yourself to be God. Show how powerful and how much authority you have, how supreme you are over everything. And boom, down comes fire. They've poured 800 gallons of water over this carcass. The fire comes and burns up the carcass, burns up the stone, burns up the water, burns up the dirt around it. There is a crater left. That's amazing, isn't it? This is Elijah, hero of God. I admire that faith. I admire that power that God speaks through him. He's available to it, right? It's just such a wonderful story of God's goodness. And then, if that isn't enough, he takes those 850 priests, takes them down to the Kishon Valley, and there summarily executes them because it's a new day for God in the country. Goes back to Mount Carmel. There he meets Ahab and says, Ahab, God tells me the drought's going to end. Let's head home. Let's head to Jezreel where you live. I see a cloud forming, and that's indication that's enough for me to believe it's going to rain. And it starts to rain. Ahab gets in his chariot or on his horse or whatever it is and drives 15, 20 miles to Jezreel, where, get this, Elijah beats him there running on foot. Usain Bolt, nothing compared to this guy. This guy can run. He can outrun a horse and a chariot. The power of God, like, it's amazing. So you have him raising people from death to life, making food out of oil and flour that just replicates itself, ravens feeding him, this incredible scene on Mount Carmel, outrunning a chariot or a horse. And you think for sure, I know how this is going to end. Ahab's going to go back to Jezebel. They're going to have a conversation, and Ahab's going to go, God's real, Jezebel. I just saw this. Elijah communicated this. He did incredible things under God's power. Let's, let's rethink what we're doing. Let's change our mind. God's powerful. Your 850 priests are all dead. God's alive. We've misled the nation. Let's change it all. Well, 
Elijah does, or Ahab does have this conversation with Jezebel. This is what we read in the first verse of chapter 19. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And of course, Jezebel goes, oh my goodness, we've really been misled. Ahab, we have to change this. It's a new day in our country. We're going to direct people to God. The God of the universe showed up through Elijah. Well, not exactly. This is what happens. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make you like that, like one of them. In other words, I'm coming for you. I'm going to take you out. I've got a hit squad coming your way. Elijah, I'm going to kill you. Okay, serious threat. To which Elijah, of course, goes, <laughs> Did you just see what I did? Did you just see the power of God? Fire from the sky, you want to take that on? Dead people coming to life? That's what you want to do? There's no way. Come on, bring it on. God's more powerful than your wimpy little threat of death, right? That's exactly how the story goes, right? Well, this is where the humanity of Elijah comes in. After all of that, after seeing the power of God in amazing ways, This is how he responds to her. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. Bet you didn't expect that. Well, you did, because you know the story, if you know the story. But that's why we don't need to know the story, because it's unexpected. You don't expect heroes to run off like that, do you? Not heroes anymore. Except, hold on, you got to know the rest of the story of this one. Why does Elijah do that? I think he does it for a very simple reason that you and I can relate to. He's tired. He's discouraged. He's fought battle after battle after battle. And yes, God's shown himself to be powerful. Yes, God is strong. Yes, God is able. But the man's a human being, and he's just tired, I think, of the repeated serial difficulties that he has to live with. And he just wants to run. You and I can relate to that, I think. Anybody a little tired of the last two and a half years? Anybody feel there's just repeated serial problems coming your way? Just watch the news, right? It's just endless. It's not good news. It's sad news. It's frightening news. It's concerning news. When COVID landed, no, none of us, nobody knew exactly what this was. We didn't know that it would lead to two years of lockdowns and masks and no masks and vaccines and then all the tension that went with that. Families broken up because of it. Political factions in our country because of it. It's just been going on and on and on. And then, tell me if you didn't experience this, each new variant brought, oh no, I thought we were past that. And then it was one more. And it was one more after that. Monkeypox, what the heck? Come on, stop that already, right? And then the tension within our own country, the political tension, January 6th and all that came out of that and then the conspiracies and the hate and and these attack ads during election season, stop already. It's just one after the other. I'm tired of it. Anybody else? It just keeps going on. And then a war in Ukraine and then the tension in Taiwan And now tension between the Palestinian people and the Israelites. Just, are you tired of it? Do you want to run? We get it. All that time, God's been at work doing amazing things. But when it's just serial stuff, day after day after time after time, we get weary. Anybody weary? Anybody just tired and want to run? Well, this is what Elijah does. This is how we read where he goes. He flees to a place called Beersheba. This is about 80 miles or so in the southern part of of Israel. He left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed. Way to go, Elijah. Elijah. You're reorienting yourself to God. That's fantastic. Good call. You, you Maybe running wasn't the thing, but at least you're praying. At least you're turning back to God and inviting his help and his encouragement. Way to go. 
Only that's not what he prays. This is what he prays. He sits under this tree and he prays that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Can you feel his despair? Can you feel that? He doesn't pray for life and God's influence. He just prays, God, get me out of here. I want out. I want to stop. So stinking human, right? From calling down fire to calling down God to take his life. I can't ever remember a day in my life. Some of you can, I know. I've heard your stories where you would want God to just take your life. Some of us have tried to take our life. Because that level of despair and anxiety and fear. This is us, right? I think of a time early on when we had moved our family here from Canada to start this church. And we're kind of paid starvation wages in the hope that Alfie could get a job. And then legally she couldn't because we didn't have our citizenship thing figured out yet. And so it was a really, really tough time. Uh, friends that said they would be part of starting the church with us decided not to be part of it. And that hurts. Like that, that's just discouraging. A funder who we needed those, those funds so much and needed his friendship, actually, died suddenly in a catastrophic accident. And not only was his friendship gone, but the funds were gone. Doing outreach things into our community to communicate that we love you and more than that, Jesus loves you and no one shows up. Those are all just discouraging things. And I remember early on sitting down and writing Jesus a resignation letter because I was done. I just didn't have anything left in me. That was God doing great things. Yes, people were coming to faith and that was encouraging and lives were being changed. That was good, but I was just hit after hit after hit. I was just done. I didn't ask God to take my life, but I asked him to take my resignation. But he never, he never took it. But there were two other times I did. Just because of how difficult life can be sometimes. I get what Elijah said. I'm not, I'm not down on him for this. I kind of admire him that he's that transparent. That this is what I'm going to run, and I'm going to pray for you to take my life. And then, and then, this is what God does. This is how God steps into that. Read this. Then he lay down under a bush and he fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat, Elijah. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals, yum, and a jar of water. Refreshing. He ate and drank and lay down again and then this happens. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, You haven't slept enough yet. So, but now you have get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. I get that. He does not come along and go, Elijah, get your butt up off of the ground. Let's go. How could you possibly, after all God has shown you, how could you do that? Not our God. Comes to him and nourishes him, gives him rest, strengthened by the food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. So, He's in Beersheba. He now travels 260 miles by foot through the most barren wasteland ever to the mountain of God. What is that? What's he doing? He's making a really good decision. This is the first time in recorded biblical history that someone goes back to the place where God met Moses on top of a mountain, where God talked to Moses face to face, we're told where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and other instructions, where God met the nation of Israel having come out of Egypt just a couple of months, and God shows up at this mountain in unbelievable ways. And Elijah, in his weariness, having been restored physically to some degree, goes there because that's where God is, or that's where God's history is. That's a good decision. I don't think he was instantly encouraged I just think he made the right choice. Why is it that when we face these times, we tend to isolate? We, we stop gathering together and we're settled with just like 
in our homes doing it online, which is good, but it's not like being together. Why do we step out of our life group when it isn't exactly what we maybe want? Why do we stop going to Bible studies or hanging out with friends? Because we isolate. That's our natural tendency. When the right thing, the best thing, because those don't accomplish much in our souls, the best thing is, I'm going to go to where I believe God will meet me. I'm going to go to him. I've got just enough to go to him. And guess what happens? This is what happens. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? What, what's the tone, do you think? What are you doing here? No, actually, if you look at it, it's more, what are you doing here? What can I do for you? That's more of the tone. And this is what Elijah says. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too, and God, it's your fault. You got me here. You did this to me. Boy, does that sound like us, right? Well, you would think he would change his mind, right? Because of what happens next. This is what God does for him. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This is what happens. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, look what he does. He pulls his cloak over his face and he goes out and stands in the mouth of the cave. It isn't the power of God in the earthquake, the wind, or the fire. It's the gentle whisper that gets Elijah out of the cave. And there he listens. You see, when we're, when we've just had enough, we really, really want the power of God to come and change our circumstances instantly. I prayed with someone after the first service who just got a cancer diagnosis this last week. She so wants the power of God to come and heal her, and I do too, and that's what we ask for. We do. But sometimes God says, listen. Listen for my voice. It's quiet, and it's gentle. Listen for it. And Elijah hears it and changes everything, right? Look at what happens next. The Lord said to, no, go to the passage just before it. Then the voice said to him, what are you doing here? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. It's the same thing all over again, right? It's just what he said before. You see, Elijah's not quite there just yet. This is the patient love and unrelenting care of God in Elijah's life. God's not easily put off. God's not easily irritated. God's not easily, I told you already. God comes to him again and again and again. And then he turns to Elijah and he tells him this part. Next verse. The Lord said to him, Elijah, go back the way you came. Elijah, it's time now to go. Get up off your ground. Let's go. I've renewed you. I've refreshed you. I've shown myself to you. I've provided you. I've resourced you. You might still not feel like it, Elijah, but go. Go. Because you don't know what I've already done in the future for you. What he goes on to tell him at the end of this is, Elijah, you thought you were the only one? There are 7,000 others just like you. Well, I didn't know that. You mean I'm not alone? No, you're not. I've got a new king in store. Ahab's going to be gone. Jezebel's going to be gone. There's a new neighboring king I'm going to put in place. You don't see all that stuff, Elijah. I do. I do. Now get up and go. Don't just sit here any longer. Go, because that's where restoration and doing it together goes. This is the goodness of our God. So I want to ask you, do you feel like running? Do you feel like saying, just get me out of this? I talk to enough of us to know that is our reality many times. Not all of us. But you came today, if that's you, to hear the encouraging words of God for you. He's got you. He has got you. 
He's got you. I don't know what that means in terms of how it works out tomorrow. But I do know this over and over again. When we do what Elijah does, we just go. We go to where he might be. In Jeremiah, we read, hey, look at if you, if you search for me with all your heart, there's a 50-50 shot you'll find me. Nope. You will find me. James says this. He says, God, I've discovered that when I come close to you, you were already there. You come close to me. This is what our God does. So if you're discouraged today, you feel you've had enough of two and a half years of being beat up or maybe more than that, you're in good company. You really are. Look what God did for Elijah. Do you think he might do that for you? Might he do that for you? I think he might. And now Jesus, here's the truth of this. It comes back to you. Because you came to us. Not only were we a bit beat up, but we'd gotten ourselves into a jam that there was no way out. The truth was, Jesus, we weren't even looking for God to get us out. We didn't even know the despair and difficulty we were in, but you did. And you preemptively came to us. And you gave your life away so that we could experience the wonder of you bringing us into the presence of our Father who loves us like he loved Elijah. You have a purpose. You don't want to have to explain it to us. You're going to carry us through. I don't even know what that means, but you don't leave your kids behind. And so Jesus, again, will muster up enough courage and enough faith to walk in your direction, believing we'll never, never walk alone.